From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Senate negotiators late Sunday released the text of their bill on border security and military aid to allies. But does it have any chance of passing? James Lankford, Republican, Kirsten Sinema, The Independent, and Chris Murphy, the Democrat, released the text after months of their negotiation. President Biden and Mitch McConnell both endorsed the bill, but critics on the GOP right and the Democratic left are already attacking it for different reasons, even before they have had a chance to fully read it. We'll talk about the merits and the politics of this bill and the border security issue in today's Potomac Watch podcast. Welcome to you all. I'm Paul Gigo with the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and I'm here with Kim Strassel and Kate Batchelder, who have been following this negotiation all along and trying to delve into this very long (laughs) bill, 380 pages, 280 pages of it are on border security. And since the final draft was released only Sunday night, we are still trying to absorb all the details and the fine prints. And forgive us, dear listeners, if we aren't (laughs) fully aware of all of the nuances. But overall, if I am permitted a editorial comment, I can say that this is the most restrictive immigration border security bill in 100 years since the 1920s. I wasn't alive then, but I did read about it. And we really haven't seen anything like it. It's often compared now by critics say, oh, well, this is just like the 2013 Gang of Eight Senate bill (laughs) that passed the Senate but died in the House. This is the whole solar system (laughs) removed from that bill. I mean, it's not even close. There's nothing here on any pathway to citizenship or pathway to green cards for illegals who are here. There's nothing for the dreamers who were brought here as children illegally and now are adults and don't want to be deported. Nothing at all. This is a security only bill. And it's something that would be hard to have imagined even four months ago, I think, when the negotiations began. Kim, so what's your impression? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When you think about the fact that A couple months ago, Chuck Schumer was saying there will not be any policy whatsoever in this bill that we come up with. We'll throw some more money at the border, but that's it. And now we have this. Anyone who is suggesting that this is equivalent to the prior gang of eight either wasn't there or is willfully misleading people or just doesn't know what they're talking about. I think just a couple of highlights I'm going to point out here to give a flavor of that. So right now, you know, if you show up at the board, you come across, you're essentially waved through, you're given a work permit upon stepping foot on American soil, and then everything is so backlogged, you get told, we'll see you maybe in seven or 10 years. For their asylum hearing. Their official hearing, correct? And in the meantime, that's seven or 10 years where people can have children on American soil, develop lives, uh, jobs become that much harder to ever remove them again if they don't meet the threshold at that ultimate asylum hearing. Under this new situation, you're going to show up immediately, be screened by an asylum officer. There's going to be a higher standard that you have to hit when it comes to credible fear. There now has to be a, quote, reasonable possibility that you are in danger. We could get into the distinctions of that, but that is a much higher standard. One of the things that will also count is, could you have relocated in your country of origin to have escaped whatever it is that you have a fear of? And then if you don't meet those standards, you will be turned away. If you are offered to get through that first screening, you will then receive an actual interview as to whether or not to make a final adjudication on this within 90 days. And those things will also include background checks and another of other higher standards, all of which are going to make it tougher to come and stay in the United States, significantly more so. Also, there's going to be more detention beds, a greater emphasis on keeping people in detention while they wait for that final hearing, and a lot more emphasis as well for those who really can't be kept in detention on on alternatives to detention that require monitoring, curfews, maybe ankle bracelets, and very stiff penalties if you don't show up for that interview. And then a whole bunch of mechanisms as well where the border shuts down if the numbers get too high. Yeah, we can go through that so-called emergency border shutdown bill in a bit. But Kate, what Kim is talking about is essentially the end of what has been called catch and release, that you go into the United States you actually seek out a border patrol agent because you want to then be able to make an asylum declaration. They say, what's your credible fear? They give you a very cursory 
interview and then they go, okay, and release you into the interior of the United States and you wait four years, five years, seven years, 10 years, whatever it is, it's a very long time. Now this under expedited removal provisions of this bill, there will be a 90 day adjudication. So why this matters in particular is it, it really changes the incentives for migrants to come here because now the incentive is if they take the time, take the risk, take the expense of paying off those uh, coyotes, the gangs that escort them to the border, they can pretty much figure they're going to make it here. But now, under this bill, they would have a much, much stronger chance of being deported. Right. I think that's right. I mean, if you look at how some of these new asylum screenings would work, like we've been talking about, you have to pass just a much higher standard at the beginning of the screening process, which is how it should be. It's worked for So long now as if you seem even vaguely credible to have asylum, that you get released into the interior. And that backlog of people who are waiting for their hearings has just gotten so long that that's why it takes seven, eight, ten years to get people through this system. So to your point, what matters here is the underlying incentives for folks to come to the border. Now, Republicans have been saying, including Donald Trump in 2018, said he needed a change in the underlying law to get a control of the asylum process. Because the truth is, you could build a wall, but if you could just go up to a border agent and claim asylum, that loophole can be exploited. So you need to fix this underlying process. And Republicans have wanted to do that for some time now. So that is maybe a political question, but it does hammer home that I think the asylum provisions are the core of this law and are the things that you can't just rely on an executive to do. All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk more about the merits and the politics of this Senate border bill when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Kate Dell and Kim Strassel here talking about the merits and the politics of the new Senate bill on border security and aid to Ukraine. Let's listen to James Lankford. He's the Republican senator from Oklahoma who has been the lead negotiator for the GOP on this bill. Are we as Republicans going to have press conferences and complain the border's bad and then intentionally leave it open after the worst month in American history in December? Now we've got to actually determine, are we going to just complain about things or are we going to actually address and change as many things as we can? If we have the shot, and it's amazing to me, if if I go back two months ago and say we had the shot under a Democrat president to dramatically increase detention beds, deportation flights, lock down the border to be able to change the asylum laws, to be able to accelerate the process, no one would have believed it. And now no one actually wants to be able to fix it and says, I don't want to even debate it. I don't want to discuss it. We have to decide as Republicans, what are we going to actually do about the border? Leave it open or actually leave it closed? That is uh, James Lankford. One other element of this that we didn't mention first is this in so-called humanitarian parole. The administration set up an app system called the CBP-1 app to facilitate free entry and immediate work permits. So if you went to a port of entry, you had signed up on this app and you were you know, from Guatemala or somewhere else. As long as you followed that process, you were pretty much guaranteed getting a work authorization permit and be able to go into the interior. Now, this bill ends that CBP-1 app process and automatic work authorizations. It does allow for some work authorizations if you pass through the higher standards for asylum, but it also includes the ability for Department of Homeland Security to revoke that work authorization, which it doesn't have now, if you violate some element of it of the requirement. Requirements. Uh, there is also here, Kim, something called emergency border shutdown provision, which is that if over the course of a one week average of 5,000 migrants a day reach the border, which we've had for the most of the recent weeks, over the course of 5,000 a day on average over seven days, automatically the border shuts down quite a while until the Border Patrol folks can get the numbers down and the migrants processed. This is a really important element to this, Paul, because I think I would think of this as kind of a two-step question in that I think the authors of this bill, and by the way, just a quick note for James Langford, you know, my view is that it's divided between those who just like to go on television and do sound bites and those who actually do the hard work of diving into policy. And Langford falls into the second category And we are fortunate to have people that are willing to do that work instead of just stand up and complain. But I think the authors of this bill, their goal here is that by having this accelerated process in which decisions are going to be made in 90 days, a lot of people are going to be turned away right at their initial screening. But even if you manage to get through and wait until an interview, that's going to be done in 90 days. And the idea is 
that is supposed to be a huge disincentive for people to make the trip unless they think they really have the goods to get in. Because right now, the entire incentive system is get in, have a kid or two here, make it that much harder. You know, maybe your number will never come up. You're just going to be here 10 years, by which point it'll be too late for them to remove you. But by making it quick, the entire message is don't come unless you think that you can get in. But if that is not a big enough message, then they have this provision where if the number of people who are showing up at the border, as you say, hits 5,000 a day, on average for a week, or if on any one day it exceeds 8,500. And let me be clear, these are not people crossing over, it's just the number of people showing up. Then the border shuts down, okay, automatically. No presidential discretion here, right? Almost none. No presidential discretion. The bill does give the president his own discretion to shut it down if the numbers hit only 4,000. So if the president thinks that we're headed toward a problem, they can actually invoke it at a slightly lower threshold. But then the border does not reopen until those numbers stay below 75 percent of that threshold for an average of a week, too. Now, I want to be clear, this doesn't count. There is a certain number of people, about 1,400, that still make appointments, believe it or not, all the right way. They don't just show up. They make an appointment. Those will continue. But this is just the number of people. If they're just showing up the border, all those pictures we've been seeing the last months, there's going to be automatic border shutdowns. Yeah, that's really interesting. Kate, the role of Jim Lankford here has been really pretty interesting. This guy's no squish. I mean, he's not a Susan Collins moderate from Maine. He's a bedrock conservative. And he'd been just deputized to get into this and and really has uh, dived into the details. We got a briefing from him on Saturday on much of this, and he clearly is conversant on all of these details. And for his work on this, he's being vilified as some kind of sellout. And you might as well think that he is, for what you hear on the political right, Bernie Sanders. Right, Paul. I mean, if you go back to the fall, the reason that Langford was tapped to lead negotiations for the Republican conference is because he had credibility across the conference and especially with conservatives. He replaced Tom Coburn in the Senate. He is a well-known social conservative, has an A-plus pro-life rating. He voted against the omnibus bill, this big spending bill. He is certainly would not even make any list of moderates in Congress. And so what's, I think, all the more depressing is that this bill and the outrage in response to it threatens to consume his career, too. And going back to what Kim was saying, there are folks in the conference, there's workhorses, there's show horses, they're split into two. And I think Langford is a workhorse. And I think it's regrettable because, for instance, if you go back to the Trump administration, one thing that Trump talks about all the time is his 2017 tax reform, how great it made the economy. Well, that, as we know, was written by people in Congress who actually knew something about tax reform. So the idea that we're just going to run out anybody in the Republican Party who takes the time to study the issues. I mean, Lankford has been in this on months. He was talking about how the parole debate itself took a month, has really deep dived into these issues and tried to come up with something that would actually help solve the problem while in divided government and is now considered a sellout, I think is just an incredibly dispiriting development. <laughs> 